Well, thank you all for coming. I am delighted to be here. Um, this is a topic that's very important nowadays to all of us as we age and we start to look at our, the consequences of aging. So the topic is dementia. I'm frequently asked, and that's one of the backgrounds of this talk, is what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Do people have that question? Do you know the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Does everyone know that? Or you don't? Have you had that question? Good. Then you're in the right place. So a dementia is, it's a term that's used to discuss a neurocognitive disorder. Cognition being our thinking, loss of ability to think, and how it affects our daily lives. So this is very important to us. Memory, reasoning, decision making are just some areas that I'll touch on today. And then the other physicians will talk to you more about that. Now here's the distinction between Alzheimer's and dementia. Alzheimer's is a dementia. And this is the list of dementias. I'll give you a moment to look at it. Alzheimer's, oops, one second. Alzheimer's is when you hit the wrong button. Uh, uh, so here's Alzheimer's. This accounts for about 75% of the dementias. Vascular strokes, you've heard of people having what they used to say was hardening of the artery years ago, and that term fell out of vogue. But there's some truth to it. If you have a lot of small strokes, you may have some cognitive difficulties. Lewy body is a form of a dementia that's similar to Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementias, which are behavioral. Do people recognize these terms or uh, have anyone ever seen any of these? Just hands up, have you seen any of these before? And I'm sure you have, in relatives and friends, unfortunately. Corticobasal is a rare one. Parkinson's has a dementia associated with it about 30% of the time. We always think of the movement aspects of it, but one of the most important things is the memory issues associated in trying to treat someone who has the movement problem. Huntington's is a terrible hereditary dementia, which we see. This is a treatable dementia, and this is what we call water on the brain. Hydrocephalus, potentially treatable. People have a gait disturbance, they can't control their urine very well, so it's important to think about that. Now, I run in Denver a Gehrig's clinic, and about 10 to 20% of the patients who have the weakness of Gehrig's, which is fatal, which many of you know, have a memory problem as well. It's very sad, it's sort of caught up with us. We used to say that you could make the diagnosis because the patient was so nice, and I think we were asleep at the wheel. In fact, it was the dementia that was fooling us with it. Now, creutzfeldt jakob is one of these mad cow type diseases. It's by a viral particle called a prion. I'm not gonna go into all of these, but I just wanted to get them on the table so you would see the different types of dementia. So the bottom line is Alzheimer's is a dementia. Alcohol will cause a dementia. So here's a little look at Alzheimer's disease, and you can see it's 70 for 5% of the dementias are Alzheimer's, and there are anatomic changes within the medial temporal lobes, and that's called the hippocampus. So when we do MRIs, we look for atrophy in the temporal lobes. And the pathology are these plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. These are protein deposition within this area. They shouldn't be there. These are tangles of protein that are confusing us. His vascular dementia, and these are 20% of the dementia. If someone has many strokes, you may find that they're confused a little bit. Aside from the weakness, aside from the speech disturbance, does this make sense? Um, they may have a memory problem that goes with it, or they may have difficulty with executive function. Now there are large, oh, there are large vessel strokes and there are small vessel strokes. Hypertension is a real problem. Untreated hypertension, dementia. Multiple small strokes from the hypertension. So one of the reasons we're doing better with dementias now is we're treating hypertension. So when your docs are all over you for your blood pressure control, this is the reason why. If you've ever seen anyone, I went to a Caribbean island to work for a little while. Untreated hypertension, they, the dementia rate was astronomical, but it was treatable had we have treated their hypertension. And people have these little, small, tiny strokes. Atrial fibrillation means you're gonna, your heart fibrillates, and so you throw little clots up to the brain. That will also cause a dementia. And then diabetes causes little, small vessel strokes in the brain. Tiny, you've heard all these terms, I'm sure, from your docs all the time. And, that, and so if you have enough of these little, tiny diabetic strokes, you will have some cognitive difficulties as well. Now, if you've been hitting the head a bunch, you know, this is the football players are the... Oh, I keep hitting that one. The football players are the ones that we've known for more recently. But in fact, we all knew the Jerry Quarries and the Floyd Pattersons who had dementia pugilistica. And that was from recurrent head hits. So they had multiple tiny injuries to the brain resulting in the dementia. 
And it's been ignored over the years. I mean, I can get caught up in a boxing match, but as a neurologist, it's hard to watch. Uh, because you know the outcome of that match. People ha are going to be demented. So the National Football League called up through one of the groups and said, Would you, what's this whole thing about this cumulative trauma encephalopathy, which you hear about, in the, you know, that it's about a $700, $700 million lawsuit, doesn't even touch the amount of money that they're going to need to pay. It turns out they've been ignoring it. And the helmets don't do enough because of the head bouncing in and out of the skull plate. And so they have a lot of trauma from that. Hockey is another one. Soccer, it's interesting. Although they, we list it, I played soccer for years. I guess I would have been chairman of neurology had I have not played soccer. But, <laughs> okay. So here's a little statistics. Um, it's more common in women than it is in men. These are the stats that have come out. And all of us in this room are worried about having Alzheimer's disease. So that's an interesting statistic. And there are the costs which we really do have to face as a country. They're massive if we don't do something about it. Okay, now, a lot of people are mildly forgetful, and we call it sort of benign forgetfulness. We all do that. Oh, gosh, there's my Alzheimer's. You know, you forget something. You lose the car in the parking lot or something like that. Or you may be in the middle of a lot of stressful situations, and you miss little things. So this is called mild cognitive impairment. And a lot of people have this. It's short, greater than long-term memory problems. You'll hear more about that in a little bit. But 70% of people will progress to dementia. Now, that statistic is probably a little better now because we're treating blood pressure and other issues that I raised earlier. Um, now, most of these, oh, well, these people function well in daily life. They just know something's a little bit wrong, or the spouses might say something, or the children have picked up on it. So these statistics, as I mentioned, they're a little better now. Everyone asks me, I've got to move through this because I've got 20 minutes to give you a two-hour talk that I give to the medical students, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, these are the different stages of the dementias, and everyone says, what, what are the different stages? So one is you're fine. Two is you probably have mild cognitive impairment. It's minor little mistakes and this and the other. Three is mild short-term memory problems. You might get lost. Four is more serious, moderate short-term memory problems. Having a little trouble just dressing, forgetting to brush your teeth, things like that. Um, time issues, you know. And then the last is really severe, your homebound. And there, we were just talking earlier, I talked with uh, one of the social service people here. People living up here are living alone and no one even realizes that the children aren't living with them and they're at home with dementias. So here's another look at it. In the early stage, you might go into the basement and forget what you're set out to do. Has anyone ever done that? Yeah. Then, now I go back to my mild cognitive impairment on that one. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> um, I mean, all of these we all do. So when I give a talk to medical students or physicians, at the end of the meeting, I'll have 20 or 30 people come up to me and say they all are convinced they have that disorder. Please don't do that. These are normal phenomena to some extent. Paying the bills twice, forgetting to take medications, these are somewhat normal. But if it's a consistent pattern that one is picking up, then that changes the game for you. And so mild cognitive impairment, word finding difficulties, executive and decision making uh, issues that come up, and then handling finance. So that's early. The middle stage is you'll forget a conversation. So you went to the movies and you forgot what you saw in the movies. That's more serious. And that tells the spouse or the children or friends that something's wrong. Repeating questions. Forget, and then becoming a little antagonistic about it. You may have seen this in friends and relatives. Well, you didn't tell me that. Well, yes, we did. We talked about it five minutes ago, and it's awful, and that needs counseling, and we'll come on that later. So severe short-term memory. The short-term memory is always more affected than long-term. If you notice, people preserve old memories from when they were kids, and they're usually right on the money. Social mistakes, you know, you're out at a cocktail party, start doing some funny things, not dressing appropriately. And then the late stage is the saddest part of the disease. Uh, people stay at home, they're reclusive, they don't eat properly. You know, you leave mom food in the refrigerator for her to eat and it's frozen. And when you get back, only the ice cream's been eaten and nothing else in the refrigerator has been touched. Okay, sleep disturbances are very common. Now, this is what I do when patients come to see me. Um, I'm looking for that 20% reversible cause, and this is the list of them. So I'll do blood work looking for B12. If, I want to know if they're drinking too much because that's very reversible. Uh, these are the more serious syphilis, Lyme's disease, HIV, hydrocephalus I mentioned earlier. Believe it or not, strokes, brain tumors can fool you. And then inflammatory diseases. Paraneoplastic refers to cancer-type syndromes where it's not where the cancer is, but it's, near, it's related to the cancer. And then neuropsychological problems such as depression, 
which may masquerade as a dementia. You're gonna hear a lot more about that. So these are the evaluations, medical, neurological consultations. I'll do a mini metal status in the office, which is a short screening test. Um, brain MRI for hydrocephalus, tumors, strokes, the labs, depression screening, psychological batteries. Uh, these are other things that are looked for that you're all probably aware of, depression being very important. If someone isn't sleeping well or they're hypoxic at night, they will be confused. I've had physicians that I've taken care of who've gone to Europe who were using CPAP at night, didn't use a CPAP, go to a strange environment, they're not sleeping well, and they come back just delirious almost, and the poor wives or the husbands, they don't know what to do with them. If you get them back on the CPAP, put them back in their house, it all reverses, it's fascinating. So if someone's having cognitive difficulties, look at their sleeping, are they kicking, are they snoring? You know, these are the little tidbits that you want to look at. Or if you're worried about your memory problem, ask your spouse and say, you know, am I kicking, am I snoring, that kind of thing. Um, hypoxia is low oxygen. Um, more advanced uh, studies that are going on now are the things like the PET scan, which has become very important uh, in research, and then the familial types, which represent about 10 or 15%. And then there are serum and spinal fluid markers, which are now being used for studies, trying to identify people earlier on who will have memory problems and trying to treat it before it's too late and the disease has progressed. So this is the question I'm assuming that everyone has. Is there anything that I can do? Well. Most of these, living in Vail, it's hard to tell people to exercise. <laughs> I'm sort of, <laughs> they're doing it. And watch their diet and socially interactive. I mean, I, my patients are all, they're doing all of those things. Um, intellectual activities such as crossword puzzles seem to have some effect. Blood pressure control, I can't stress enough. Vitamin D, it turns out, has been proven to be effective. Not vitamin E, but vitamin D. So you can talk with your docs. And then issues of lowering homocysteine and cholesterol agents being pro or con, it's, that's still debated. Don't stop your simvastatin right now, it's for your heart. That would be a mistake. Vitamin E, I said no. Currently, there is no cure. And so the medications that are used, I don't know if people have been on these things, Aricept, Nemenda, Exelon, they have very little effect as far as I know. They're, they're expensive and they really don't do anything. They don't cure the disease, there's a minimal treatment effect. Cognitive therapies, you may hear a little more about that later. If someone's depressed and you miss the depression and they look like they have a dementia, it would be a mistake. You really want to get to the depression because you can turn the whole thing around. It's amazing. In my practice, I see people coming in that are like 30 and 40 and 50 years old saying that they think they have dementia, Alzheimer's, and they're just severely depressed. Treat the depression, it's gone. Some of them are holding down four jobs. It's hard to imagine they're depressed, but they come in with a spouse who says, geez, he's forgetting everything. He forgot how we got to dinner last night. He forgot this, he forgot that. But you know, they're holding down multiple jobs. Um, I don't like the antipsychotics or the behavioral changes. I think they're dangerous. So I favor sort of you know, um, behavioral techniques over those. Um, and these are some of the research things. I started to list them. There's a lot going on. I'm not gonna go through all of that right now. But here are some other research uh, issues. There was a vaccine that reversed Alzheimer's, but it resulted in an encephalitis and death. So it really was effective. It came out of Israel. Yeah, it had a bad side effect. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then trying to remove the beta amyloid or the other proteins that are in the brain, that's where these things are going. Tau protein, amyloid protein, synclinite, you'll see them all as you look at it. Um, neuroinflammation has been treated. We've used intravenous gamma globulin. We've used steroids. Nothing has worked so far on that. Calcium, heavy metals. For a while, aluminum was looked at pretty hard. Uh, and then the mitochondrial little energy organelles in your cells, we've looked at those. Um, I, I want to broach this just for a minute. Caregiver roles. Turns out that as there's no treatment now, most of my time in the office is spent with the caregiver. The patient really isn't having the problem. It's the caregiver who is struggling. Does anyone have any experience with that? Just by hands. I mean, that's who's suffering. They have to be with them 24-7, activities of daily living, and it's destroyed their whole social life. You know, it's really, it's very difficult. So that's why social services uh, are involved in these things. Um, I like the neurobehavior rather than medical approaches to behavior, uh, dealing with repetitive questions, constant supervision. These are all the caregiver issues. And then, as I said, I run an ALS clinic as well, but 
There's palliative care. People live a long time with dementias. So even though you're not treating them and curing them, you have to deal with that kind of thing. So your physician should be looking at that for you. And then the one bane of my existence is the driving. People feel they can drive, and they do get into accidents, so I have to stop their driving. So you have to look at whoever you're, who has a dementia, make sure that they're safe, because it can be a disaster. And I'm, up, I'm done, thanks. This first slide says that life cannot go on without a great deal of forgetting. I think it's important to know that just because we forget things, that it's not necessarily pathological. Think about all the things that have happened to you today that your eyes have seen, that your ears have heard, that you felt, that you perceived, that have no real importance to you. What time did the clock say when you first looked at it on the nightstand? How many stairs did you climb or descend coming down here? What are all the people at your table wearing? Um, these are incidental things that you can't remember, and that's not necessarily bad. Just imagine how clogged up our brains would be, how cluttered they would be if we remembered each and every facet. So what happens to us as we get older is that we start to pay attention to the things that we can no longer recall, and that worries us. But I'm here to say, don't worry so much about that because there are normal brain changes that occur as we get older. Also, forgetting is a good thing in that there are terrible things that we don't want to or need to remember. We can't remember, for instance, exactly what it feels like to have a toothache and to have a tooth drilled. Thankfully, we forget some of the pain and anguish associated with terrible things like the Kennedy assassination or the 9-11 tragedy. Thankfully, we can't remember what it was exactly like during childbirth. We'd stop at one child if that were the case. So there is good forgetting, and, uh, and not all forgetting is bad. How many times have we gone to grab our car keys exactly where we had left them, and they're not there any longer? Um, or how many times have you walked into a room at a party, seen a familiar face, and then had that momentary uh, panic about not being able to recall the name and being worried that you were going to have to uh, introduce that person? It happens to all of us. And um, a lot of gray hairs out there. So there are a lot of people who are owner operators of what we call the, the aging brain. Um, but it's really important to remember that not all lumps are cancer, and not all forgetfulness is Alzheimer's. Um, we need to remember that the idea of having word-finding problems, like if I come from the park and I'm trying to tell you about uh, my grandson having a great time on that, on that favorite ride of his, you know, um, the one that goes round and round and has the animals that go up and down. Um, the who's -a watches, you know, the whatchamacallits. Um, yeah, the carousel, that's right. That kind of word finding experience is very, very normal and doesn't have to be indicative of a, a kind of dementia. I think this is cool. I, uh, I was on the, the internet and I googled uh, images of senior moments and one of the first things that came up was this image here of a brain fart. <laughs> That's normal. We all have those. Okay. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about um, what we know in terms of neuroscience that uh, tells us the, the kind of abilities that tend to slip with age. Um, the first one up here is the ability to learn new tasks and making new associations. Learning to do new things um, or 
doing old things in a new way. That's the old dog, new tricks phenomenon. That when we have to learn to do new things as we get older, it takes us a little bit more time on task. It doesn't mean that we can't do it. It just means that it's going to take us a bit longer to do it. Tasks that involve speeded responses, fast responses, that tends to go down a bit with age. And retrieval of names and nouns is, uh, is very common as we get older. Now, the good news is that there are abilities that seem to hold up with time, that don't seem to change as we get older. These include skills like semantic ability, meaning our word knowledge and our vocabulary, our understanding of language doesn't seem to change as we get older. Our procedural knowledge, in other words, what comes first, what comes next, how to do things in sequence, that doesn't seem to change, especially for overlearned uh, things, like if we like to cook, how to do recipes, or the things that we might have done during our workaday world, those things tend to, tend to stay intact. Our motor memory tends to stay pretty stable. So we remember how to type, we remember how to bowl, we remember how to ride a bike. Our abstract reasoning stays intact. Our judgment and problem solving stays intact. Long-term memory store, our ability to talk about things that happened to us in college or to remember when the kids were young, long-term memories tend to stay intact. And probably the most important and the hardest to define is our wisdom. In other words, the collective experiences that make us understand things deeply, that tends, tends to stay intact. So the next time that somebody talks about a red hot stock deal and all the younger people are subscribing and, and signing on to it and putting down their money, we older folks tend to remember that. We remember the number of times that we've been taken and we apply that wisdom to the new situation. And that's something the young just can't appreciate. Now, a couple, a couple of these things have been touched upon before, but I think it's really important when I say that not all lumps are cancer and not all memory problems are Alzheimer's. There are a number of things that masquerade as dementia, and I want you to know these. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, sleep deprivation of as little as three days can result in us not feeling sharp. Excessive use of alcohol and drugs, response to anesthesia, certain cancer treatments can result in mental dulling. We call that chemo brain. That's a real phenomenon. Head injury and concussions, seizure, uh, brain surgery and heart bypass can result in a decline in mental abilities. As Dr. Triaf said before, depression, dissociation, bipolar, schizophrenia, and some other mental disorders can result in a, a lack of mental sharpness, as can severe anxiety. So this constellation of, of uh, symptoms or of problems um, talks about the importance of stress. When we are under enormous stress, our cognitive sharp, uh, sharpness goes down. Emotional trauma, thyroid disorder, ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, TIAs, and uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as MS, Huntington's, and uh, Parkinson's. Also, migraine headaches can result in lack of memory functioning. The other thing that we have to do, whenever you're uh, worried about mental slippage or cognitive slippage, Take a look at the medicines you're taking and ask your doctor about them because many of them can result in this memory decline. Anti-anxiety agents such as Xanax can result in dullness. Cholesterol drugs, anti-seizure drugs uh, like Depakote, um, some of the antidepressants. This is a big one here in the valley, narcotic painkillers. If you've had uh, orthopedic surgery and are taking Oxycontin and Oxycodone, that can lead to mental dullness. Doesn't mean you're slipping into uh, dementia. Hypertension drugs, some sleep aids like Ambien, uh, incontinence drugs, and antihistamines can all 
uh, result in a decline in mental functioning. So first thing to do when you suspect that you might be slipping, read the labels, talk to your doctors about uh, unwanted side effects of the medicines. Now, normal changes in memory, they do tend to increase in age. In fact, our brain mass uh, reaches its peak in, in our 20s and starts to slide off after that. So there are some subtle changes that occur. But these are these changes that we don't need to worry about right away are slowly progressing, and they're only apparent occasionally. They're not constant. And they often happen when we're trying to learn something new, and um, often happen when we're under a greater stress. The important thing is that they don't result in a functional problem, like it doesn't result in our inability to function on our own or to be independent. There's a big difference, for instance, in forgetting where your car keys are and looking at a toaster and not knowing what it does. So the subtle things like little slippages where you can bounce back from it uh, usually don't indicate a progressive dementia. Now, let's, when to be concerned? We need to be concerned when it affects our functioning, when we're no longer able to do the things that we normally do. Um, and also we need to be concerned when there are safety issues. So minor forgetfulness, missing an appointment or two is not a big concern, but certainly leaving the stove on a second and a third time or backing into the pillar of your garage a second or third time is reason for concern and you should be checked out. Now, psychologists have a role uh, in, we have a, a long history in terms of uh, measuring mental functioning. It goes back to World War II when huge numbers of recruits were being taken into the army and we needed a fast and efficient way to categorize people in terms of what their skills were. That was the development of uh, cognitive testing or IQ testing. Um, we now have about 3,600 different types of tests that can be administered. Um, all of them that are published and used by psychologists uh, have validity, reliability, and they're tied to norms. Validity means that there's a concept that's being measured that can be measured accurately and repeatedly and that it has some sort of a predictive value. Reliability means that we can use the same measure again and again and again and get scores that are, um, can be, be relied upon. Similar to what you would get when you use a scale. If you step on your scale at home, you should be getting the same measurement as when you step on a scale at the office, uh, of your doctor's office, unless, of course, you dial it back five pounds to make yourself feel better. Um, but psychological tests have uh, accuracy within about uh, five or seven points, so that we can use those kind of tests to measure changes in our mental abilities now versus how we are functioning at an earlier date. The kinds of measures that we can um, assess or skills that we can assess, long-term memory, short-term memory, verbal and oral or hearing uh, memory, facial recognition, and also uh, visual-spatial relationships. These are all specific kind of skills that get measured, and we can then compare them to your pre-morbid functioning or before you experience the, um, the memory slide. And we can compare you to people who are in your exact age group because all of these tests are normed on large populations. And um, so we can tell you how you're doing compared to other 69-year-olds or other 65-year-olds or other 65-year-old males. We measure things like word knowledge, uh, verbal fluency, your problem-solving abilities, your math computation, your reading, spelling, and writing. 
And so we measure a whole host of abilities that relate to how you function in day-to-day uh, -day living. Now, um, one of the nice things about uh, psychological testing is that it, um, it's not invasive, it's not intrusive. We can usually do it in a couple hours in an office. Most people who take psychological tests find them to be rather interesting. They're constructed in a way so that you don't have uh, a frustration effect. That as soon as you start having difficulty on a different uh, particular kind of a task, we shift quickly to a new task. And so most people who go through a psychological uh, battery experience it as a kind of interesting, uh, fun, uh, puzzle-solving, problem-solving um, experience. Um, another reason why we might want to do it has to do with things like uh, disability claims. If, uh, if you have a psychological evaluation on TAP and then suffer some sort of a mental decline, we can then we can talk about the percentage of a decline that you've experienced over time to substantiate a disability claim. There are an awful lot of companies who will have their CEOs evaluated at a time that they're very high functioning, so that at some later point, if they're uh, if they suffer a decline, um, that decline can be proven, and they can then uh, collect on their disability claims. So. Uh, before I go, I just wanted to make you aware that there is a wonderful website um, that's put up by AARP. And it's www.aarp.org. And if you're interested in this kind of a topic, and not just here for the Great Sun and Alp Free Lunch, um, there's an awful lot that can be learned at this uh, website. Under the www.aarp.org, if you click on the brain health uh, tab, what you'll find is that there are mind and memory and fitness games that you can play. And Dr. O'Neill uh, will talk about this in a little while. Um, it'll talk about diet conditions, and you can learn an awful lot about uh, memory, Alzheimer's disease, the treatment for it. And um, you can also take baseline tests so you can start to evaluate, evaluate your own current functioning. And they're quite good. They're quite sophisticated. And if you go to the website, you will understand you'll understand why this might be an important slide. It says, pad kid poured curd pulled cod. It's a tongue twister. If you can say it 10 times fast, it may have an implication for how likely you are to eventually be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Welcome, friends and neighbors. It's nice to see you. Good news, the interstate's open. I just saw it on my phone. So you can all get home this afternoon. <laughs> um, I hope you're all appropriately terrified. I am. I mean, we just hear that stuff and think we've got it ourselves. I want to point out, I'd like to, I have an ambitious goal here. I'd like to at least point out the idea that you can do things after leaving today that'll make your life more vital with the knowledge we have today. I kind of think of... Um, decline, which is normal, as a glide slope. Where's Dave Bentley? That's a, that's a metaphor we share. And so if you're going to descend in an airplane, the way you manage that is with the amount of power you put into your descent. We don't have a choice about our aging brain, but we do have a choice about what we do with it. And what I want to point out is that we can often get trapped in protecting ourselves, and we end up keeping ourselves from doing things we matter about or that give us vitality. So there's a process behind that. The Harvard Business Review calls it emotional flexibility. That's not right. And we call it psychological flexibility. It's the ability to have a reaction 
and not have to act on it so that we can act on stuff that we do care about. So when our brain gives us something that scares us, we tend to withdraw and protect ourselves. So let's physicalize that because this is a normal process and I don't want anybody leaving thinking that being activated is a bad thing. We have developed a brain over time that's built primarily to protect us. So if you think for a moment about pre-humans um, living in the old Divide Gorge, out picking roots and tubers, and, and uh, Mark and I are out there doing that in our blue sweaters, and some predator shows up and he freezes, and I keep moving around, that means that I'm not gonna make it into the gene pool, and he is because the animal's gonna go after me. And so over time what we do is we've developed a brain that's built to protect us from predators. Well, here we are, and there aren't many predators around. Now there are some, but that's not what we have to deal with here. Our predator lives in here. So let me explain that just a little bit more, because um, Mark, you talked about going to a party. No about going to a party and forgetting somebody's name and then getting increased tension, and then you can't remember it at all. Well, that's because we focused on the threat. When some predator shows up, we focus on the threat, which means we notice other things going on around us, and we don't get information except overlearned information in our head. So we're never gonna remember that person's name at that point. But a bunch of other stuff happens too. Our pupils dilate, we get better visual acuity, our mouth dries out, our throat tightens up, our thyroid produces thyroxin, raising our metabolism, we start to perspire, our bronchioles dilate, we start to breathe more rapidly, digestive system slows down, peristalsis stops, gastric acid, well, slows down, gastric acid secretion stops, all kinds of terrible stuff happens, but we're really good at getting away from the predator when that happens. We don't have predators anymore, but we have a brain that's developed, and what it does is it remembers the circumstance that triggered that reaction. And so now our brain can trigger the reaction we can't think, we feel all anxious, we get all locked up, we don't notice what's going on. Our brain becomes an inhibitor of valued action. Everybody still with me? I, I stopped the scary stuff, you know, the pancreas and the liver and the cholesterol increases and not being able to focus or concentrate, and, but we know what anxiety feels like. Okay, that's a normal process and we can't get it to stop. So this is the good news. It can be triggered by a predator, it can be triggered by our brain. Um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is a really good example of the brain triggering a physiological reaction, and then the emotions and the thoughts following it. So we can all relate to that. But we have this system in our brain, and this is relatively new, and that is that we relate things to one another. So if I say, make a sound, lemon, Almost all of you will think of a little yellow fruit. And then maybe something associated with that. But all I did was make a noise and yet the fruit showed up in your brain. That's pretty simple, that's just a derived relationship. The important thing here is if I think of a lemon, I think of a slice of lemon. If I think of a slice of lemon, I think of salmon at Jack X house. But that was delivered by BC who works up on the mountain who used to be a salmon boat fisherman in Alaska which reminds me of Elmendorf Air Force Base, which makes me think of Vietnam, which reminds me of roommate Hal Mischler, whose name is on the wall up in Washington that I've never been to. And that takes place in a nanosecond. And that can trigger a reaction, a physiological reaction and its consequent emotional and cognitive reactions. We can't win at getting that to go away, folks. So we have to do something else with it. When we're stressed, we begin to have brain impairment. It can mask itself as dementia. The big problem is for most of us here is it keeps us from doing what matters. We have stories about ourselves, who we are, what we do, and if something challenges that, we protect it as if our life depended on it. If, someone, if I say I'm kind and someone says, no, you're not, you know, I called you weeks ago and you never called me back, that's not very kind. If I, if I, hear that, I could react as if my life depended on it because of this primitive system. So we have to have a way of breaking out of that so we can begin to pursue what matters. So 
I've given you handouts that cover all this sort of stuff, so you don't have to remember it, because I know that's a topic here today, I was trying to remember all this stuff. But how do we develop this psychological flexibility so that we can live a vital life rather than a life that's full of struggle? So if something happens and we start to get activated, I'm not gonna use the word anxiety because like lemons, it triggers anxiety. But if we get activated and we don't wanna be because it's aversive, then we're gonna try and do something to get it to go away. It might work in the short term. If I go down to the Brush Creek Saloon, have a couple of beers, my distress goes down in the short term. But then I've got my memory that causes the anxiety and a drinking problem, which we now know causes dementia. <laughs> so in the short term it works, we're not all crazy, but in the long term it doesn't work at all. So we gotta break free of this system. And the alternative to having activation and struggling, which makes it worse, is to be willing to have the activation for what it is, not what it says it is. The brain triggers the reaction as if it's the thing that the word stands for, lemon, and it isn't. So there are a couple of elements to this. The first one is to begin to see yourself as the place where those thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations happen. And you already know that. You already know that you've been you your whole life, and all these different experiences have come and gone, and they're just experiences. But if you want to develop this ability, begin to step back and see yourself as the place where this stuff happens, not the stuff itself. In other words, you're the human, and here's your brain. We're the observer of that, that activity. And that allows us to be present to it without trying to get it to go away, which gives us freedom, real freedom. With this kind of freedom, you are no longer attached to your reaction as something you have to act on. You're free to have the reaction and act on what matters. And that means vitality, putting energy into your life, rather than wasting it struggling with your brain. That can be facilitated by being able to flexibly pay attention to what's going on in the present moment, rather than getting hooked by what's going on in your brain. If you're up there thinking about what's going on in your brain, you're not gonna be able to get cues from what's going on in the present moment to act with vitality on what matters for you. That's what you get to choose. That whole process of being the observer, having flexible attention, being able to come back to the present moment rather than being scattered or rigidly attending to one thing, allows us to accept our reaction. Not, you know, kind of nose to the grindstone, suffering through it, but really exploring it because it's a normal, natural reaction. So you're after the idea of when this happens, it's going, hmm, what is that? Oh, that's just like me to be that way. I learned that when I was five and I'm still doing it. So that process of accepting your reaction keeps you out of the struggle. The struggle keeps us from vital living. So the next piece is, is that's facilitated by the idea that your thought, your reaction is just one way of responding to a situation. And the moment you've stepped back from your brain, the junkyard, if you will, the storehouse of all your ex experiences, the moment you step back from that, then you can see it as just one way of looking at a situation. So something that, that could be really angry making, a normal response to something, you can go, oh, I really matter about this, that's why I'm so mad. So the next step is that frees us to say, well, what do I want to do with this? Here I am angry, what do I do with that? Well, if I act angry, I'm probably going to do something in the short term that works, get whoever caused it to be quiet, and in the long term have, has awful consequences, as you've probably all had the experience of. So then we must decide what qualities we want to bring to our life. What do we want, our base, what do we want to base our actions on? So I use kind as an example. So if somebody does something, if I do something that's unkind, and I know that I want to be kind, I can self-correct. If somebody does something that aggravates me, I can say, how could that person sit at that green light and not go through it when I want them to? Or why is that person talking to the grocery store clerk when I'm in a rush? Well, I could get angry, and we've all done stuff like that, get the own horn push the other person out of the way, go to another line, do something like that. But what we want to do is say, okay, well, if I want to be kind, what can I do in this situation that allow me to be that person? 
So the situation doesn't determine who we are. Our reaction doesn't determine who we are. We determine who we are. And then finally, I've got a list of things there that we know from various forms of research that have been alluded to by my colleagues that you can begin to pursue that we know will work to help you with the aging brain. But mostly it means being vital about your life, not getting stuck, struggling with the stress. That leads to anxiety disorders and depression. Depression is essentially unresolvable difficulties, behavioral depression, not the organic depression unresolvable problems that we keep focusing on trying to get them to go away and it doesn't work. So if you take a look at the list, there's a list of things that come from various sources that you've probably all read if you're here in the first place. You've read all the health letters in the New York Times and all that sort of stuff. So I've taken it from there and also from Robert Sapolsky's book, which has a lovely title, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And it explains all this physical stuff for you if you want to read it. So. Valued living, doing what matters, means you can put your energy into stuff that is going to work for you rather than putting your energy into trying not to be distressed, which is a declining process. So that's, a, that's sort of the end of my talk. What I'm hoping for is that you've got just an idea that there are things you can do starting right now that'll help you live a more vital life with whatever kind of brain you've got.